Okay, so um, let's start for the second part. Um, today we start uh, tackling the programming part of the course, uh, which might be either the most exciting or the most difficult. I don't know. Uh, um, just before starting, uh, I want to perform a little survey on your uh, knowledge, basically. So if you can uh, just answer by raising your head, uh, your hands. Um, so how many of you uh, are using window machines? Okay, o almost off, okay. And uh, how many are using uh, Linux or Unix based machines? Okay, and Mac? Okay, yeah, it's a Unix based. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so around one third for, for each operating system. Okay, in this course we are sticking to uh, Linux machines basically because we have a uh, Linux machine on the lab. So uh, apart some uh, few instructions for uh, Python installation uh, and uh, starting tips, you will get all the lessons and examples in a room, in the classroom. Uh, they all will be done uh, by using Linux. But anyway, if you have any question, just tell me and I will try to answer. Um, the other thing, how many of you already have some uh, uh, programming knowledge? Okay, almost all. And uh, uh, how many already know Python? Okay, okay, only few. Uh, perfect. So, um, Today I'm starting from the very basics, just for uh, uh, recalling uh, basic concepts of programming and uh, things, things like that. But if you feel that they are too simple, just uh, raise your hand and tell me, I will try to go faster on this first uh, argument. Um, okay, let's start. Uh, this is our goal. You already know this um, definition in a way. You're, you must have seen the definition at least, I think, three, three or four times. So just remember what I mean intelligence uh, is. A system for ambient intelligence is a digital environment that proactively but sensibly supports people in their daily lives. That means uh, the system has some feature, which are proactiveness, the ability to act autonomously, sensibility, the ability to act without interrupting, without offending the user. And it has the need to support the people, not to place obstacles in the people's lives, okay? So the idea is that all these features need in some way programming for being implemented, okay? So that's why we learn programming and we start with programming basics. So programming comes into play when we want to design the techniques and the algorithms to coordinate all the environment subsystems. Uh, in the previous lesson, just a few minutes ago, you were talking about home automation, basically. Okay, the home is one environment that can be made intelligent, and it is composed by several subsystems collaborating together. So you got the typical automation plant, or you may have the Wi-Fi system, or the smart TV, or your PC. All these systems work, must work together to provide an intelligent environment, an intelligent ambient. And for making them work together, you need to program at least some of the subsystems or maybe something which is upon, is placed upon the subsystem and coordinates them to behave all together as a single organism, as a single system, okay? So this is just a, a justification for our need to program. <laughs> so the goal is to coordinate the home components, but we want to reach this goal in this course by focusing on the features rather than on uh, programming idiosyncrasies, uh, dialects, uh, uh, difficulties related to 
specific languages. So the idea is to try to tackle the intelligence problem, the intelligence design, and solve some real problem. You will all uh, work uh, in uh, group teams uh, for, uh, for the final exam, and this uh, is part of the idea of tackling real problems. Okay, so uh, the programming language choice reflects uh, this uh, idea of trying to solve problems rather than try to learn uh, some specific programming skill. And that's why we choose Python. We choose Python basically because it's quite easy to learn, even if you don't know anything about Python, let's say also about programming, okay? It's quite easy to uh, get uh, some first program working and some rather complex system working with few lines of code, okay? So the idea is that with Python we can focus on the features and avoid programming stuff or limit I just think this is all programming. And we want also to try to limit all the problems related to the syntax, to compilation problems, linking, portability, uh, mathematical abstraction, and so on. We don't want to be distracted from our goal, which is providing intelligence to them or to the environment, okay? That's why we use Python. So, for today, we start introducing Python, okay? So please forgive me if you already know the language, <laughs> but I will try to go slower, at least at the beginning. So what is Python? Python is an easy to learn, and that's why we choose it, but powerful programming language. Powerful because we, you can do really complex tasks in a really few lines of, of codes. So, uh, this is really uh, interesting in our course because uh, with few lines we just st can start uh, managing devices, coordinating devices, switching on and off lights and so on. And in general, it's a good language. It's an ideal language for uh, rapid prototyping. It's a scripting language, so you can uh, rapidly test your, uh, your ideas, your algorithms, and uh, test if they can work, if they can be uh, amended, or if they are already optimized, and so on. So uh, that's, these are reasons that push to uh, the adoption of Python in a, in a course. And let's try uh, to go back a little bit to find where Python was uh, uh, defined for the first time. It was defined in 1991, so it's quite old language, not so old, but we can consider it a mature, okay, 20 years, more than 20 years. It was firstly designed by Guido Van Rossum, which is still working on Python. Um, and the general, it's a general purpose language, so you can, in principle, program for any problem, okay, not just for smart environments, not just for uh, parsing text or whatever, it's general. It's an high level uh, program language, and we will see what's the difference, just to recall the difference. And uh, it has a syntax which tries to put emphasis on the readability of the code and the easy, uh, ease of understanding of the code, uh, the program is right. Uh, sacrificing somewhat other uh, constructions or uh, uh, formalism which are typical of other languages. Okay, so you, you get a very simple language in a sense, somewhat a little bit ambiguous, uh, but not so much actually. Um, and the main feature of the language is, I think that the cleanness in a sense. So you, you get programs that are very, very uh, polished, very, very clean to read, very, very short, okay? And that's a, a really important feature for our course. Um, so let's try to go back to the principles of, in, of uh, computer science. You almost all know what I'm going to tell you, 
but just to remind everything, what, what is a nine level language and what is a low level language? Because here we are speaking of a nine level language. So in general, a nine level programming language is some programming language that is really near to the human language, okay? So the instructions, the, uh, the operators, the things that you can do are pretty similar uh, to the language you normally use for speaking, for example, with the other people. So it's expressive. It is usually short for uh, just performing some operation. You don't need to write line of line of codes. So if I want to say hello to everyone, I just write something like print hello. OK, this is an eye level language. Uh, usually, in a le an eye level language is portable because it's eye level. So you write once. And then, with few or non adaptation, you can move the code on across different machines, across different operating systems. The degree uh, by which this few modification changes depends, uh, of course, on the language. There are some languages which, which are uh, more portable. Let's say if we speak of Python or of Java, they are quite easy ported from one system to the other. If you are working on a C language, which is still an high level language, for porting the programs you write from one system to the other, you need to recompile the program, OK? So it, it changes the way you port the, 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 the program, but in general, it can be ported. The counter uh, part of this portability is that actually the code must be compiled, must be translated in some way for the machine to be uh, understandable to be executed by the machine, OK? So um, once you get the program, before running it, you, you need something, some other programs that translate your program text into a code that, that is understandable by the machine, OK? And in this translation process, there might be some uh, problem of optimization, for example. So the code you write is less optimized than uh, the code you, can, the code you uh, could write if you just write directly the machine code. Okay? But it's, of course, much, much more complex writing the machine code. So just to have an example, this is an high level language. This is Python, by the way. Okay? So if I want to print hello on the console, I just write print hello. OK? That's very high as a level. What happens if I want to describe a low-level language? A low-level language, in a sense, is the opposite of an high-level language. Because generally, it is directly executable, or almost directly executable. But to be so directly executable, it tends to be uh, bound to the machine, bound to the operating system. So it cannot be ported in general. But it is also more efficient than an higher level language because it uses all the features of the system, of the operating system in which works, which might be different from system to system, of course. But what's the problem with low level languages? Is that they are really, really difficult to write and to read because they are near to the binary code in a sense. So if, what, what if you want to write the hello word that we wrote before with just one line in, a, in an assembly language, in a language which is a low level language? This is the same code in a, a Linux assembly for 64-bit uh, machines. So to print hello word on the console, you have all these kind of instructions, almost of them are readable. What move means, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, what, what is a section or a, yes, yes. So um, all these operators, uh, you must know the operators. What are they? What they are doing? Uh, and if you just give the program text to anyone. Nobody, or almost nobody, is able to understand what the program does. Okay, so that's the difference. 
But this is more optimized than the first one, probably. And cannot be moved on another machine. Okay, so that's the main difference. Boy, other two, defi other two definitions are about um, the way programs get translated. Okay, we said that an high level language must be translated for a machine to execute it. And there are mainly two ways for translating this code. The first one is interpreting the code and the other is compiling. What's the difference? Interpreting means that the program that translates the code do the translation, does the translation basically line by line. Okay? So it takes one line of your high-level code, translate that line into a low-level code, which is understandable by the machine. Okay? And this is done almost line by line. On the other hand, a compiled language does the translation process before executing the program. So all the program in high level code is translated in low level code. And once the translation has finished, the program is executed. So all the lines of the high level language are converted before executing. And this allows for some languages to perform some optimization because the translator, the compiler, knows everything about the high level program okay and may apply some optimization which are not applicable if you just translate line, line by line because you, the translator doesn't know what are the lines uh, which uh, still have to come okay so that's the difference why i'm bothering you with all this definition just to uh, provide a, a framework for python python is an interpreted language so it's a language that in principle is interpreted, is converted line by line. Okay? And since it is an interpreted language, we can use it in an interactive mode. That means we can debug, we can test our programs by directly interacting with the interpreter and asking the interpreter to translate one by one the instruction we give to it. Okay? So for example, if we want to play with the interpreter and just translate the, the high-level program 1 plus 1, I want to sum 1 plus 1 and get 2, I can just type 1, 1 plus 1, press Enter, and get back the result of the translation, which is 2. Okay? So, if I type 1 by 1, here, I just broke, oh, let me increase the character. Okay, can you see? Okay, this is the Python interpreter, for example. I want the interpreter to interpret one plus one and execute this code. I just write one plus one, and then hit enter, and I get two. And you see that after printing enter, I get back this, um, uh, three greater than signs that indicate that the interpreter is ready to interpret another instruction. Okay? So here I'm running the interpreter in the so-called interactive mode. I'm interacting with the interpreter, providing the code line by line. What if I want to exit? I just type another instruction to tell to the interpreter to quit. Okay, so if I type quit, then it will get out, okay? This is interpretation. But there's another way for running a program which is easier and which is uh, easier to use when you have long programs is to just write down the whole program code and then ask the interpreter to interpret the whole program, okay? Line by line, of course. And to do that, you just call the interpreter, Python, and you give it the name of the program file that you want to interpret. That usually has the extension .py. Okay? So if I want to do the same thing 
uh, by using uh, a file instead of uh, the interactive um, interpreter, I can just do the same. So let me go back. Okay, and if I write here just one plus one, okay, same thing as before. Okay, and then I run the script, so Python. It should, it should work, <laughs> but let me check. Okay. Okay. Let's do it like this because um Okay, so now I run the same script. The difference is that since this is not running in interpreter mode, I need to tell him explicitly print the result. So that's why I, I wrote print one plus one instead of just writing one plus one. Okay, so I can run the interpreter in both mode. Usually, one develops the program by writing a file, a text file, but if there are some pieces that need to be tested because I'm writing a new algorithm, because I'm, I want to test a function that I don't know and, and so on, I can just uh, bring up the interpreter and try it interactively so as to check the code I'm writing before uh, hand and maybe uh, amending it if it needs amendments. Okay. Okay. So. Um, some notion about installation. If you have a Linux machine, you don't need to do anything because usually it comes installed. So you just need to check that you already have Python and which version. We are using Python 2.7. Okay. Uh, in theory, all 2.x versions are good. Uh, take care of not having the 3.0. X versions because we, um, the language is a bit different. Okay. Um, if you instead uh, have a Windows system, you can install Python. Um, the Python interpreter comes as an executable file, and we will see how to install it. And once you get the interpreter installed on, on the machine, your Python programs can work on all systems without modification or with the almost uh, no modification. I'm saying almost because if you go low level and you try to use some system specific function, then you lose your portability. Okay. Um, what about Mac? On Mac PCs, usually Python is installed. You can check it by opening a terminal and typing Python. But if it isn't, you can just download it and install, okay? So let's see how to install on Windows because it's the most complex installation uh, procedure. Uh, for installing on Windows, you need to go on the Python website. Uh, this uh, should be bookmarked uh, because uh, basically it's a reference. So when you need some information on the languages, some documentation, you go there, okay? Um, and it's www.python.org. You download from that the EMSI installer, and you just hit a couple of times, OK, 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 finish to get it installed. OK? So it's just a, a wizard installer, really nothing complicated. At the end of the installation, you have the interpreter installed on the machine, and 
you can just open up a terminal, which in Windows uh, means uh, pressing the window button, okay? And if you want uh, directly get access to the command line, you can press the win window button plus R and you get the run dialog and just type CMD. Or if you just want to do it by using the search function, you just hit on the Windows button and then type CMD, it's the same. But at the end, you get a terminal. And in the terminal, you can type Python minus minus version, which is the same instruction I type in any, in any other system. So if I type it in my system, which is a, a Linux system, and I type Python minus minus version, we see that my Python interpreter is 2.7.5. For uh, the latest release for Windows, uh, uh, in the 2.x series uh, uh, is 2.7.6, if I'm not wrong, okay? So don't worry if we have different Python versions, they, they work together. Okay, um, you might encounter some problem when installing on uh, Windows and trying to uh, type Python's uh, minus minus version on the, on the command line, um, because maybe you need to set the path. So uh, if the, the program doesn't run and Windows is complaining, say, saying uh, the program uh, doesn't exist, this is not a command, just uh, move into the directory where Python is installed and retry and it will work, okay? After that, you can set up an environment variable for fixing the path and having uh, the Python script reachable from everywhere. If you need the uh, instruction how to do that, just <coughs> ask me. Okay, so next part. Uh, you have seen that I developed the, first, the very first program in Python today by using a very, very low level text editor. Okay, I just type it vi and wrote something. Uh, this may be used for very, very uh, small programs, okay? But if you need to develop a little bit more complex program, you need to have some tool that help development, which are not provided usually with a text editor. And what you need is what, what is so-called integrated development environment. So what is an integrated development environment? It's a software that provides a text editor, Okay, we need it. But also a set of tools for checking the code you are writing, running the code, debugging, that means uh, finding the errors inside the code. Okay? So it's a, a kind of complex text editor with some more functionality, which is the program development. Okay? And one of the best functionalities uh, any that offers is, auto, is code complexion, for example. You don't remember what's the keyword to type, you just type the first letters and then ask to the development environment to suggest to you the hand. If you try to do the same in a plain text editor, you cannot. Okay, so that, that's why we choose to use an IDE, because it helps in the development. And in our case, uh, there are several IDEs available for Python, but one of the uh, best IDEs is PyDev. PyDev is uh, an extension for a general purpose uh, development environment, which is Eclipse, which is uh, originally designed for developing Java. Okay, so it needs the Java virtual machine on your machine. And uh, you can easily install it by downloading the Eclipse uh, zip file or tar.gz tar, uh, tar, uh, uh, file from the um, eclipse.org. And depending on the machine you are, uh, with which you are running the, the program, you need a different version, of course. So for example, uh, for Windows, you will get uh, a, a zip file for uh, Unix, for example, this is for 64-bit Unix, you get uh, another compressed file, okay? So, uh, nothing particularly difficult. 
Once you got the compressed file, you just unzip the file, you uncompress the file in the directory in which you want. So for example, on my PC, the file has been uncompressed in application Eclipse. Okay, just to give you an example, and you got a couple of things there, and one executable, which is usually named Eclipse, okay? And that's why you have different packets for different operating system, because you need an executable that depends on the system. Once you start the Eclipse, you just run it, you get a plain Java development environment, something that has nothing to do uh, to the Python development, okay? But it can be, easy, be easily transformed in a Python development environment by just installing a plugin. And to install the plugin, you must do this. Let me try to show you. Okay. Okay, this is the development environment where you have three different zones. This one is the text editor, basically. At the moment, it's empty because I have no file open. Okay. Um, on the left, oh, sorry, let me do like this. Uh, on the left of the slide, you get um, the project part where all your projects are listed and inside the project, the files you are writing on. And... In the lower part, you, you get the console. That means the command line, the same that we uh, used uh, directly uh, when trying to run the program. Here is wrapped inside the ID uh, window. So when we want to install the PyDev extension, we just need to go on Window, Preferences, select the available software sites, Okay, so the sites from which the editor uh, can download extensions and add this, uh, let me open, okay, the PyDev update site. You have all the, the references on the slides, so just don't, don't write, you don't need it, <laughs> okay, don't write down the, the URL. Um, so you, you cut and paste the update site, you give it the name PyDev, so that you remember that the update site is for PyDev, hit on OK. And after that, you can go on the Help menu, install new software, select PyDev. OK. Wait a moment. And you will get here one selection, which is named PyDev, and which is the one you must stick. Okay? For me, isn't, it isn't available because it says all items are already installed, because I already installed the, the extension. Okay? But you just stick this part here, hit on OK, and you will get the PyDev extension on Eclipse. With that extension, you are ready to develop your programs in Python, to debug them, so to find errors, and to test them, okay? So let me go back to the slide. Okay, so let's try to do this, the same thing as before. Let's try to open the Eclipse, it's already open, and write inside Hello World, okay? The very first example we, we have done directly on the command line. So, here, 
here. Uh, let's open a new project. To open a new project, you must uh, select File, New, PyDev Project. Sorry. OK. And I give it a name. So for example, Lesson 1. Finish. OK. And inside this project, you develop a new Python module, a new Python file. You give it a name, for example, Hello World. OK. Empty. And this is an empty Python file with some line inside. These lines are comments. We are going to see how comments can be uh, written in Python, but just to inform you that these are comments. So they don't execute anything. Uh, let me try to increase the character, but I think it's a little bit more difficult in Eclipse. General appearance. Hmm. Can you see any way? <laughs> because I think it's a little bit complex. I can do it, but... So, first line, print, quote, double quote, hello world, double quote, okay? That means print on the console, hello world. We can run it just hitting on the play button, okay? Run as Python run. And you got here the result. Hello world. Okay. So really, really simple. It's a, just a text editor plus uh, some wrapping around the Python interpreter. Um, okay. And what if we want to perform another experiment and Computer sum, exactly the same we did before in Eclipse. We can just type print number plus number. Okay? So if we go on and after we just write print 12 plus 32 and we run it, we get 44, the result. Okay? So here we are already programming. Something really stupid, something really easy, but we are programming. So going back a bit, just to provide some more definition to remember, what is a program? I'm speaking of programs without defining them. So let's try to define a program. Uh, it's a sequence of instructions, okay? You see, uh, in our program, we just wrote print, print. Print is an instruction that tells to the interpreter to print something on the console. Uh, and the instruction that compose the program specify how to perform a given computation, okay? In our case, the computation was, for example, uh, 12 plus 32, or just print hello world. But in general, the instruction that compose a program can be of five main types, which are input. You want to get some input from some external source, maybe the user, maybe some other source. Output, you want to display data, provide data. Okay. That doesn't mean necessarily that the data goes on the console, maybe it goes on another service or whatever, but it's uh, some data generated towards some other user. Then you perform math. We just wrote 12 plus the 2. This is a math operation. So you want to compute something. And the other thing you can do is uh, perform some conditional execution. Uh, perform this piece of code if a condition is true. Otherwise, perform this other. This is conditional execution. Or repetition. Write for 10 times hello world on the screen. OK. These are more or less the different types of instruction you can write in a program. And with just five types of instruction, you can write all, almost all programs in the world. Okay. So 
the process of programming is the really complex task to divide a problem into small pieces and divide the pieces in smaller pieces until you get something that can be encoded with those five types of instruction. So the process of programming is, is, it is basically a process of dividing problems in sub-problems. Okay? And that's the most difficult part when one starts to program. And doing this operation, usually you perform errors. Because we are humans, we are not used to simplify, we are used to abstract. Okay? So when we try to simplify the, I don't know, you want to cook a, a cake, and you start cooking, and you get a recipe for cooking the cake, and then you need to explain the recipe to another people, and you already find difficulties in remember, okay, you need to put, uh, I don't remember, 200 hectograms of flour, then maybe some chocolate, but I don't remember what. That's the way we explain to the other people. But this cannot be done with a computer, because a computer needs something very precise to execute. So you need to split the problem in a way that you can describe it with the simple instruction you have uh, at hand. Okay? So keep it in mind because that, that's the main problem when starting to program. Uh, when you program, you can uh, make mistakes. There are basically three kinds of mistakes. The easiest one is the syntax error. You just type the commands in the wrong way. Very easy. The first time you run the program, you get the error. Python is an interpreted language, so the program is not compiled beforehand. And the only moment in which you find the syntax error is when you run the program. But we are using an, a development environment which helps us, because before even running the program, it already checks the syntax. That's another reason for using a developing environment. The other error you can incur in is the semantic error. And this is much more difficult to detect. And the semantic error is when you write a program which is supposed to execute something, but it does something else. It is correct from a syntax point of view. It, can, it, it gets executed without errors. But what it does is different from what you want. And the last type of error Easy to spot, a little bit less uh, easy to uh, correct, to identify, is the so-called runtime error. So something happens at runtime that makes the program fail. This is usually signaled on the console, so you get, okay, a runtime exception. But then you need to figure out why that was this, that exception. Okay. Whenever you get an error in a program, and the error is not a syntax error, you have what, uh, what it's called a bug. Okay. So if you listen to someone speaking of bugs, a bug is an error in a program. It stems from the early uh, computers, which were very big. They all the entire rooms. And sometimes real bugs died on the circuits, causing errors. That's why they are called bugs. And debugging is the process of collecting bugs or removing errors from the program. And if you are a skilled programmer, then you must be a skilled, a skilled debugger, OK? Because usually programming implies debugging. OK, so once you start learning programming, the first thing you must learn is to identify the errors, even before solving the problems. Okay, this was the very first part. Do you have any question? If you have any question, just ask me. Otherwise, we can start with a little bit of real language of Python. Is it okay? It was too annoying? Okay. Okay, so let's start with some Python. Uh, lesson. First thing to learn in Python is how to format the program, how to write the program, okay? Even before knowing which problem we want to solve. So, uh, 
Python program is a text file. We already seen it. We already tried to write the text file in different ways. But basically, it's a text file. So if you have a text editor, you can program in Python. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult than using a development environment, but you can do it. Every line in the text file is called a statement. Okay? It ends a statement. So a new instruction. Every new line means a new instruction. And if you need to write comments, every comment is started by a knocked off character. Okay? The other important thing is that Python is based on tab identification. That means uh, every block of code is identified by identification. If I want to group a set of instructions together, I just need to ident them by two or a multiple of two spaces. Okay? We usually adopt the four spaces policy strategy that uses four spaces for identifying blocks. So every time I need to identify a set of instructions that need to be grouped together, I ident the lines by four spaces. And please pay attention. I, I, I know that I am knowing, but it's really important. The identification is mandatory and really, really important. If you don't perform correctly the identification, the program won't work. Okay? So if I want to define this block of instruction, okay, here, sorry. <laughs> The instructions are grouped because they are all four spaces that they identified towards right. Okay, so they belong to the same block. And here is where the development environment helps another time. Why? Because it already has the four spaces strategy encoded inside. So whenever you press tab on the, on the keyboard, you get four spaces. And if you type a wrong identification, for example, just three spaces, it will signal to you, pay attention, because you are adopting a wrong identification policy. Okay? But this is really important, because most of errors at the beginning uh, are due to wrong identification. Okay. So another annoying slide. <laughs> I don't require you to remember anything of this for the moment, then maybe in the future we'll, uh, learn, you will learn some of these commands because we are using them. Uh, these are the keywords. That means these are the words that you cannot use in the language unless you mean to use them. Okay? They identify operators, functions, which are reserved. Okay? And if you scan, quickly scan the, the keywords, for example, you'll find the one that we already used, which is print. That means print on the console. And there are many others of them. OK. So uh, let's start with numbers, which are the easiest thing to do with the program. What if we want to perform operation? There are several operators, the mathematical one, basically. Uh, and they have a corresponding representation in the language. The main operations are uh, use exactly the same representation of the other languages. So you have the plus for the sum, minus for the subtraction, the slash for the division, the asterisk for multiplication. Okay, and this is the common base you almost all already know. Then they come the other. Double asterisk in Python means elevation. So if I want to just print 2 to the power of 3 in a program, let's do it. We can just print 2 to the power of 3. Double asterisk 3. And it's saved. Okay. And this is already much easier than in other languages, much compact, more compact. Okay. Other operators 
percent, it's a reminder of the division, okay. almost equal uh, to the other languages. And the uh, late, la, sorry, the other one, the four remaining one, are referred to comparison. So they check if a number is greater or is uh, uh, lesser than another number, okay? So there are less than, greater than, less than, equal, or greater or equal. They are almost the same in of the other languages. So if I want to check if two is less than three, and run the program, I will get true. Okay. It's a bit different from the other operators because it provides a, what is called a, a Boolean value, something that can only be true or false. Okay. And it is usually to perform, uh, used to perform uh, conditional execution. So you check a condition and you perform some operation or other operations. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you can. But ju I just keep them because they are not so basic. Yeah, but you can. So here is a, a little bit more complex example uh, about using numbers and some math operation. So let's try to read first the program to check that the program is readable and you can understand it and then we can try to implement it directly. So the first line writes on the console, I will now count my chickens, okay? And if, in effect, uh, here you have the screenshot of the execution, and the first line is, I will now count my chickens, okay? Then the second line uh, tells to the interpreter, print hence, and then afterwards, print the, print the result of 25 plus 30 divided by six. And you get 30. Is it right for you? Yes. Here there is some implicit information which I, I still have to tell you, but you already know because you already have done some programming course and some math course. The division has a precedence with respect to the sum. So the interpreter first performs 30 divided by 6 and then sums the result to 25. And that's why it's 30. Um, the third line, sorry, is prints the number of roosters that we have. And it performs another computation where the module is involved. And the computation is 100 minus 25 multiplied by 3 divided by reminder the division by 4. Okay? So 25 by, uh, multiplied by 3 is 75, and divided by 4, it leaves 3, okay? And 100 minus 3 gets 97. So the module as a precedence uh, is, a, sorry, the multiplication as precedence with respect to module which has precedence with respect to the minus sign, okay? Uh, and we can go so on and so on. Uh, you can experiment with, with those instructions, but uh, just for summing up, the order of operation follows the so-called PEMDAS order, or PIMDAS, uh, where every letter reminds the, uh, an operator, so first parenthesis, then exponentiation, then multiplication, then division, then addition, then subtraction. Okay? That's the order. And if you have two operators which have the same precedence, for example, two multiplication, they are performed left to right. Okay? Just to remember. Okay. So let's go forward with the naming conventions. Uh, how do you name your things, your pieces of code inside your programs? 
Okay, we still need to explain what variables are, but almost of you know what a variable is because you already have done some programming course. Variables, function, and attributes in Python are named using lower characters joined by an underscore character. Okay? So this is the, name convention, uh, the naming convention. So for example, I, if I want to write my variable and use it, my variable as a label, I just write down my underscore variable. Okay? No camel case. If you are using to program in Java, don't use camel case. And don't use our other notation. This is the, the reference one. And if you are defining constants, something that doesn't change during all the program execution, it is uh, usually advisable to use, oh, sorry, uh, this one, um, to use the all caps version of the joined uh, representation. So everything, every letter is in uppercase and every word is joined to the other using the underscore, okay? And finally, for identifying classes, we, we don't know what they are, but we will. Um, for identifying classes, we use uh, the static caps notation. That means all the words that describe a class are joined together directly, and they all start with an uppercase letter, okay? For example, static caps there, okay? So this is just to remember how to write the program because also the notation is important. Okay, let's start to play with the so-called variable. What are the variables? Just to sum up quickly, you already know what a variable is, but basically you can consider it as a container, something in which you can store a value, which can be either a number, a string, or whatever. Okay, differently from other languages, uh, Python is a dynamic language that means that Variables do not have at, uh, uh, a type at the, write, at the time of writing, but their type is detected during program execution. This doesn't mean that the type uh, uh, is not checked. The type is checked, but it is checked at the runtime. Okay? So, um, if you write a variable A and you assign to the variable a value 1, that, va that variable will be an integer value. Okay? But this check will be only performed when the program runs. Um, and this allows, for example, to reuse the same variable for different types. So if I want to store a number into the variable A and then print it, and afterwards I want to store a string in the same variable, I can do it. And everything works. So let's try this. Um, Here I write my variable so that we can get a notation. My variable equals to three, and I want to print the variable. Okay. And then I get, I want to assign a string value to my variable. And print it. Okay, let's save, execute, and you see that I print three and a low. Okay, so the same variable changes type during execution, and this is perfectly uh, allowed, and it's different from some other languages when, where a variable has a type and cannot change. Okay. Um, okay. More experiment on variables. Uh, I said that the, the type is checked at runtime. Can we check the type of a variable? Which is, uh, can we ask the interpreter to tell us the type it has detected for a variable? Yes, we can. The instruction for doing that is called the function to, for doing that is called type. That means, please give me the type you interpret for this variable. And let's try to play a little bit more with the variables and numbers to understand better. So, 
if I continue my program and I say uh, a equal to 1 and then I require to get the type type of a I will get this is an integer okay and if I get a variable b and I write 3.45 and print the type this will be a floating point number because uh, it has the decimal sign okay and let's try to experiment with this but let's do it on the inter interactive interpreter because it's more interesting so I just run Python let's print this number one two three four okay what are you expecting what's the result one two three four right what if I write zero one two three four what do you expect Exactly. So you might expect, might, I'm saying, not everyone, but someone might expect that printing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 returns 1, 2, 3, 4. Instead, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 means octal, it's an octal number, it's in, interpreted as an, as an octal number, and when you print it, you get the representation as an octal number. Okay? Just to check it, try to print 0, 1, 0, 8. In an octal system, the first cipher is 8 by the power of 0, 1. The second will be 8 by the power of 1, exactly here. And if I type 0, 1, 1, 9 okay and if I type 0 1 0 0 I will get 64 so prepending a 0 to a, num a number converts it into an octal it means this number is an octal number okay so it's just to pay attention when you write because if you uh, just write quickly and you put a trailing 0 in front of an integer number what you get is the octal number which is not the one you wanted so that, that was a, a trick just to play with. OK. Some more variables. Um, let's try to interpret this part. Um, here we just assign some numbers to variables. So 102 cars, uh, 4.0 to space in a car, uh, 30 drivers, 32 drivers uh, to the variable drivers. 90 to the variable passengers, uh, and then we start computing. We can compute using variables exactly in the same way uh, we perform computation using pure numbers, okay? Because variables are just containers, okay? So if I want to count the number of cars which, which haven't driver, I just subtract from cars the number of drivers, okay? Uh, and as well, I can perform multiplication, divisions, and so on. And this is the result, OK? Uh, all these examples are bundled in a zip file you can download from the website, OK? So if you want to go back and experiment, you can just download the files and play with them. OK? OK, I think, OK, we can just perform this, uh, and then uh, we can stop, because I think it's uh, time to close the, the lesson. Um, Strings. We already seen strings. We just type uh, print hello world. Hello world is a string. How can we detect that the variable is a string? A string is identified by quotes, which can be either double or single. It doesn't matter. In Python, they are exactly the same. This allows some uh, uh, tricks to avoid escaping characters, but basically you can choose which you prefer and either use double quotes or single quotes. They work uh, exactly the same. Can you use mathematical operational string? 
In general, no, you cannot. Okay, but there are two operations that can be performed on string. One is the plus operator. Plus operator changes completely its behavior in case of strings, and instead of summing, perform concatenation. That means placing one string after the other. Okay? So if I write here, print, hello, plus, word, okay, and I run it, I will get hello word. They are just joined together. The plus joins two different strings, okay? And the other operator is the multiplication operator. That, for strings, means repetition. So if I want to repeat three times, hello, I can just print, hello multiplied by 3 and I get hello 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 okay in a sense it's really easy to understand really compact okay well, let me check okay I think we can stop here because it's late. Um, also for the strings, you got the examples in the same zip file. So if you download the file, you get the example for all the slides. Maybe some examples are more advanced uh, than this point. But anyway, you can experiment with that. If you have any problem, just ask. Uh, next lesson, you can just stop uh, or at the beginning uh, and ask question. The next lesson will be on Monday, and we will be in the lab. Okay where we explain uh, basically uh, the um, final exam, uh, the teaming part, uh, so composition of teams, uh, selection of uh, group work, and so on. In the first part, in the second part, we will perform some hardware fundamentals just to get it started on uh, the hardware part. Okay? Okay.